Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the special topics and today we'll look at the law of tots. Now the word tot comes from the Latin word totum. It means twisted. So a tortuous liability is a twisted liability. It is not a direct liability. It is not straightforward. It is a civil wrong. A civil wrong, as you remember, it is a wrong is a violation of a right. A wrong happens when a duty is not done. And a civil wrong means that it is a wrong of a civil nature. It is not a criminal wrong. So it is a wrong in which one person has violated the rights of another person. Or one person has violated the rights of a group of persons or a group of persons have violated the right of one person or a group of persons have violated the rights of a group of persons but the state is not involved so in the tort cases you will have the cases of a versus b or a versus this group or this group versus b or one group versus another group you won't have things like the state versus so and so Similarly, when we say that it is a civil wrong, so the remedy will not be a punishment. The remedy or the objective of doing of giving a remedy here is not to punish the offender, but to provide the person who has been wronged with certain compensation. So you, you are trying to right the wrong. So a tort is a civil wrong. And this civil wrong arises out of a twisted conduct. It is coming out of a conduct that is not a straightforward conduct. Tortuous liability arises from a breach of duty fixed by law or duty towards persons generally. So because it is a wrong, so there will be a breach of duty. So a breach of duty will create this liability and this breach of duty is fixed by law and it is a duty towards persons. It is not towards the state or towards the society. The breach of duty is redressed by civil action for unliquidated damages. That is damages whose amount is not predetermined or assessed in advance. So how is the redressal done? The redressal of the breach of duty that has resulted in the civil wrong called tort is done by a civil action. So the case will be held in a civil court, not in a criminal court for unliquidated damages. That is damages whose amount is not predetermined or assessed in advance. So for example, if somebody has damaged your car, then you will put up a case for damages. And in this case, you cannot assess the quantum of the damage in advance. It will depend on how much of the damage has been caused already. So you cannot say in advance that any damage to the car will result in a penalty of so much amount, say 500 rupees, because the damage may be for 50 rupees or the damage may even be for 50,000 rupees. So it is unliquidated damages. You cannot predetermine the amount. You cannot assess it in advance as against things such as contracts. So in a contract, you can always say that, okay, I have a contract that I'm going to purchase a house for say 50 lakhs of rupees. Now, if in this contract, the other party does not give me the house, then I can 
ask for this 50,000 rupees back, uh, 50 lakh rupees back. So the breach of a contract deals with not unliquidated damages, but liquidated damages whose amount can be predetermined. So the amount would be given by the contract itself. If the house was being contracted for 50 lakhs of rupees, so 50 lakh is the amount. It if it was being contracted for 80 lakhs of rupees, then 80 lakhs is the amount. But when we talk about tortuous liabilities, we cannot determine the damage in advance. It cannot be assessed in advance, so it is an unliquidated damage. So tortum, tort is a civil wrong arising out of a twisted conduct, arising from a breach of duty that is fixed by law, duty towards persons and it is retraced by civil action for unliquidated damages. So you are asking for compensation, but you cannot predict the amount of this compensation in advance. What are the essentials of a tort? When do we say that there is a, there is a case of a tort? There must be a wrongful act committed by a person. So there must be a person, it's not the state, there must be a person who commits a wrongful act. A wrongful act is a, an act that is violative of a right or an act that is breaching a duty. So there must be an act. Now this act must result in a legal damage to another. Legal damage is damage of the rights. So this wrongful act must result in some legal damage. Now in this case, injury without damage is actionable. An injury is an infringement of a legal right. So if there is an infringement or a violation of a legal right, that is an injury and there is no damage, that is there is no actual loss, even then there will be an action. So there will be a tortuous liability. This is known as injuria sine damno, injury without damage. So injury without damage is actionable. It would result in a tortuous liability. A case law here is Ashby versus White from 1703. Now in this case, the plaintiff that is Ashby was prevented from casting a vote by White who was a constable who considered that Ashby was not a settled inhabitant. So what was happening? Ashby wanted to cast his vote in the elections. White, who was a constable, he did not allow Ashley, Ashby to cast his vote because he considered that Ashby was not a settled inhabitant. Whereas the case was Ashby was actually a settled inhabitant. So he had the right to vote, but still his right was violated. Violation or infringement of a legal right is an injury. So in this case, there was an injury to Ashby, but there was no damage. Because if you do not cast your vote, it does not result in a financial loss. So this is a classic case of injury without damage. So in this case, there was no financial loss or damage incurred by Ashby, but his right to vote has had been infringed upon, leading to an injury. So what did the court say? The court said the right of voting at the election of Burgesses is a thing of highest importance and so great a privilege that it is a great injury to deprive the plaintiff of it. So the court accepted that the right to vote is something of a great importance. So it is a very important right. It is a great privilege that is made available to the rightful voters and to deprive the plaintiff of his right to vote was a great injury. If the plaintiff has a right, he must of necessity have a means to vindicate and maintain it. So if there is a right, then there must also be a means to vindicate and maintain the right and a remedy if he is injured in the exercise or enjoyment of it. So if there is an injury, that is the violation of the right, so there has to be a remedy. 
you cannot say that because this person has not suffered a financial loss so there should not be a remedy there has to be a remedy there has to be a compensation just because the right has been violated there has been an injury and indeed it is a vain thing to imagine a right without a remedy that is if you say if you talk about a right without a remedy then it is a vain thing it does not make any sense to talk about a right without a remedy for want of right and want of remedy are reciprocal so basically what the court is saying here is that if there is any injury if there is any violation of a right then even if there is no financial loss even if there is no damage to the person then too there has to be a compensation there has to be a remedy because if there is no remedy there is no right if we do not provide a remedy to this person then the rights to vote will go on being violated if there is no compensation for violating them and so this is a very classic case of injury without the damage then we have this essential of a tort that damage without injury is not actionable that is damnum sine injuria damage without injury so if there is a damage if there is even a financial loss but if injury is not there that is no rights have been violated then it will not make a tort there will not be a liability or a tortious liability so damage without injury is not actionable here the case law is the mayor of bradford versus pickles from 1895 now in this case the plaintiffs had land with natural water springs that were used to supply to the town of bradford and the defendant had land on a higher elevation and over a water reservoir from which water flowed into the water springs the defendant sank a shaft into his land due to which the flow of water to the natural springs got affected so what is happening here is that there is a hilly region and there is a reservoir of water underground and this reservoir is feeding into a natural spring that is if you have rain then the rain percolates into the soil it fills up this reservoir and then below the ground the rain moves through the soil and then comes out here in the form of a natural spring so in this case the plaintiffs had land with natural water spring who is the plaintiff here the mayor of bradford so the mayor of bradford or the uh, city of bradford had certain lands with natural water springs and these were used to supply water to the town of bradford so this water was transported to the town of bradford through pipes so all the citizens were using it the defendant had land on higher elevation that is pickles so let us say that this is the land of pickles so this is the land of pickles and the land of pickles was on a higher elevation and over a water reservoir from which water flowed into the water springs now what did pickles do he sank a shaft into the land due to which the flow of water to the natural springs got affected so what pickles did here was that he drew a shaft into the ground to tap this reservoir and in this process the flow of water to the natural springs got affected so basically the mayor of bradford or the uh, or the city of bradford is now suffering because they are now not getting the water that they were getting before so will this lead to a tortious liability so the court held although the defendant's action does deprive the plaintiffs of water which they would otherwise get 
that is if pickles had not done this then it is obvious that bradford city or its mayor would be getting the water but it is necessary for the plaintiffs to establish that they have a right to the flow of water because remember that a tort will only arise if there is a violation of a right so the plaintiffs would have to establish that they have a right to the flow of that water that was violated and also that the defendant has no right to do what he is doing so there has to be a legal sanction against what pickles is doing so you have to establish two things one you have a right and two that particular right has been violated by the other party now in this particular case i am of the opinion that neither of those propositions can be established so basically the mayor of bradford cannot establish that they have a right to the flow of water and they also cannot establish that pickle has no right to sink a shaft so because both of these things do not arise so there is no tortious liability so basically what it is saying is that injury without damage is actionable but damage without injury is not actionable in this case there is no injury there is no violation of a right because the mayor of bradford is unable to prove that they have a right over this flow of water and there is no violation of this right because they cannot also prove that what pickles has done is against the law so if both of these things are not there then there is no tortious liability so damage without injury even though the mayor of bradford or the city of bradford is suffering they have a damage they have a loss but then too because there is no injury so there is no tortious liability another thing that should be there is that it must give rise to a legal remedy so a tort will only be there if the act can give rise to a legal remedy that is the law is able to provide for it here we have the maxim ubi jus ibi remedium where there is right there is remedy so if there is no remedy then there is no right so these are the essentials of tort so how do we differentiate a tort from what we have read before what is the dif- the distinction between a tort and a breach of contract now a tort is a civil wrong but a breach of contract also is a civil wrong so what how do we differentiate between both of these in the case of tort the duty is imposed by law whereas in the case of breach of contract the duty is imposed by the parties to the contract so this is one difference who gives the duty is, is it the law that gives this particular duty that was not done or is it the contract that is defining the duty in the case of tort the violations of a right are in rem that is against a thing for example if you have a house and your house is getting trespassed or if you have a car and the car is getting damaged so you have rights in respect of this particular thing that is your house or your car and whosoever does the damage whosoever gives you the injury will be liable so you have a right against the whole world in respect to these particular pieces of things or these particular properties so as we saw before this is a right in rem a right against a thing whereas in the case of a breach of contract it is a violation of a right in personam against a person the people who drew up the contract who signed the contract they are only liable towards the actions because the rights are against those people if there are two parties then a has the right over the action of b and b has the right over the action of a they do not have any right with respect to the rest of the world 
they do not have any rights with respect to a thing but in this case they have rights with respect to each other against a person so that is a breach of contract in the case of tort at times intention is taken into consideration whereas intention is irrelevant in the case of breach of contract in the case of a breach of contract the court is only going to see what you were required to do as per the contract and whether you have done it or not it is not going to look into what were your intentions in doing something whereas in the case of torts tortious liabilities the court is also going to look into what were your intentions in doing something so intention plays a role it is sometimes taken into consideration for a tort but it is never taken into consideration for a breach of contract then in the case of tort damages are unliquidated that is the amount is not predetermined or assessed in advance whereas in the case of breach of contract the damages are liquidated and the amount is predetermined or assessed in advance so this is the distinction between tort and breach of contract similarly we can also look at a comparison between tort and crime now in both the cases tort and crime both of these are violations of right in rem so in both the cases you have rights not against a person but against a thing you have a right against all the other people in the society or in the world because you have a certain thing because you have a certain right in the case of tort as well as in the case of crime so basically if somebody took away your car so, so in that case there is a tortious liability against that person whosoever it be it is not a specific person but any person in the world who uh, takes away your car has created a tortious liability on himself but he or she has also create, done a crime and in both the cases it's not a specific person but you have these rights against any person so both of these are rights in rem in both these cases the duties are imposed by law so these are the the similarities between a tort and a crime and you'll find that in a large number of cases the same action creates a tort as well as creates a crime so what are the differences between tort and crime a tort is a private wrong whereas a crime is a public wrong a tort is a private wrong means that it is a violation of a private right the right of one person or a group of persons whereas a crime is a public wrong so it is a violation of the public rights so the whole society the whole public is affected in the case of a crime whereas in the case of a tort only a single person or the group of persons is affected so this is a major difference private wrong versus public wrong private wrong because it is a breach of private duties and public wrong because this is a breach of public duties in the case of tort because this is a civil wrong so the object of action is compensation what do you want you say that i have suffered an injury and so i must be compensated whereas in the case of crime the object of action is punishing the wrongdoer because he or she has done a wrong against the whole of the society so he or she has to be punished for committing this crime so the objects are different in tort it's compensation here it's punishment in a tort the individual has to approach a civil court for redressal whereas in crime the state initiates prosecution against the wrongdoer so basically taking your car example again if your car has been stolen if there is a case of theft then the state is going to prosecute the thief for the crime of theft 
you are not required to go to the court and say that my car was stolen and so you should punish the thief. It's not your job. It's the state's job. The government will take care of it. Whereas taking the compensation is your job. So you will have to approach the court and say that because my car was stolen by this person, so this person should pay me back the value of my car. So even though it's the same action, but it has resulted in a tort as well as a crime. And the difference here is that in the case of the tort, the individual has to approach a civil court for redressal in the form of compensation. Whereas in crime, the state initiates prosecution against the wrongdoer to give him or her the punishment. So these are the differences between torts and crimes. Now, we have been talking about tortuous liabilities. What is that? Now, in we have looked at crimes and we said that crimes consist of two things. You need to have actus reus and you need to have mens rea. Actus reus is a forbidden deed. So, you have done something that you are forbidden to do. And mens rea is a guilty mind. So, you need to have a guilty mind. Only then it will be called a crime. So, crime is actus reus plus mens rea. But in torts, a man is presumed to know the natural and probable consequences of his act. That is, even if there is no mens rea, there will be a tort. Because a man is presumed to know the natural and probable consequences of his act. So, in torts, there is no need for mens rea. And in a large number of cases, there is also no need of an actus reus on the part of the person who gets the liability. It is also possible that somebody else does something wrong, somebody else has done an actus reus, but still you may be responsible. Because this is a twisted liability, this is not a straightforward liability, that you are only liable for your own actions. No. You are also liable for the actions of others that have been done on your property, on your estate. So, in the case of a crime, mens rea is important, but in the case of torts, mens rea is not important. People are presumed to know things, and at times, even actus reus is not important on the part of the person who, get, who creates the liability. So, let us now look at some tortuous liabilities. Are there different forms of tortuous liabilities? So, the first tortuous liability is a strict liability. It says that if a person possesses anything that is inherently dangerous, she or he is strictly liable for any damages caused by such possession. It is immaterial how careful the person is. So, if a person is possessing something that is inherently dangerous, what are things that are inherently dangerous? Things like crop dusting, fumigation with things like cyanide gas. So, cyanide gas is a very dangerous thing. Storing flammable liquid in urban areas. So, if you have a storage of petrol or diesel or kerosene in urban areas, then it, they are inherently dangerous things. If you have oil wells and refineries in populated areas, they are inherently dangerous things because there is always a danger that something can go wrong. So, if a person possesses anything that is inherently dangerous, that is if a person is doing any of these, then she or he is strictly liable for any damages caused by such possession. So, if anything goes wrong, then the person is strictly liable. It is immaterial how careful the person is. So, even if you have taken all sorts of precautions, but because you have knowingly stored something that is inherently dangerous, so you are strictly liable for it. So, if you have taken all the precautions, it means that you have no mens rea. And if, if uh, this danger occurs not because of your action, then you may also not have an actus reus. But just because you have these things, inherently dangerous things on your property, so you are liable. So, this is a strict liability. It is a tortuous liability. 
and there are three essentials for establishing a strict liability there must be a dangerous thing inherently dangerous so there must be a dangerous thing kept on a non natural use of land that is if you are storing flammable liquid in urban areas it is not a natural use of land if you are drilling oil wells in populated areas it is not a natural use of land so there has to be a dangerous thing or activity that is going on on a non natural use of land and there must be something that escapes to the plaintiff so this dangerous thing should escape to the plaintiff if you are doing crop dusting and the chemicals escape out there is you were doing cloud dust uh, crop dusting but there was a gust of air and the chemicals escaped from this location and went to somebody else and created a an injury then you will be held strictly liable if you have stored flammable liquid and if this liquid leaks out spreads creates a fire then you have a strict liability because it has escaped if you if you have uh, kept cyanide gas and if it escapes there is a strict liability so there are three essentials for strict liability there must be something that is a dangerous thing it should be kept on a non natural use of land and it should escape to the plaintiff what are the case laws the first one is ryland versus fletcher from 1868 now what happened in this case was there was a reservoir that flooded the neighboring land upon filling the owner of the reservoir was held liable even though he had contracted the work to a contractor so what happened in this case was that here again there was a structure like this so there was a person who was creating a reservoir of water and when this reservoir was being constructed and this reservoir was being constructed by a contractor and this contractor found out that there are some old shafts here which are connected to other locations and these old shafts are not in a very good state they are in a state of disrepair so if water gets filled in then the water will also leak out through this shafts now remember that the person who is owning the reservoir is not doing this he has contracted everything out to a contractor but what the contractor did was that he did not amend these shafts and so when the reservoir was filled water moved through the shafts and it flooded other areas so this is what happened a reservoir flooded the neighboring land upon its filling but in this case the owner of the reservoir was held liable strictly liable because creating a reservoir is not a natural use of land keeping a lot of water in a reservoir is a dangerous thing it was done on a non natural use of land and this water escaped to the plaintiff so all these three conditions were met and so the owner of the reservoir was held liable even though he had contracted everything all the work to a contractor so in this case the owner did not have an actus reus the owner did not have a mens rea but still he was liable because of the tortious liability another case law is crowhurst versus amersham burial board from 1878 now in this case a person planted poisonous plant on his property it was a yew plant a yew tree so this tree was planted on the property and it so happened that the branches and the leaves of the tree they were able to reach into the property of his neighbor so essentially we can say that you had a situation that there is a poisonous tree that is growing and it is right on the property line and with time when the tree increased in size then some portion was able to cross so here we are saying that something was able to escape to 
द प्रॉपर्टी ऑफ दिस पर्सन द प्लेंटिव सो दिस इज द प्लेंटिव प्रॉपर्टी एंड दिस इज द डिफेंडेंट्स प्रॉपर्टी now there is this poisonous tree and the branches and the leaves have escaped to the plaintiff's property now the neighbor's horse ate these branches and leaves and died now in this case the person who planted the poisonous plant he was held liable because here again you have these there is a dangerous thing a poisonous tree kept on a non natural use of land because it was planted there and it had escaped to the plaintiff if these three conditions are there you will have a strict liability another case law is ponting versus nokes from 1849 now in this case ponting's horse died after entering nokes land and eating the poisonous leaves so what is happening in this case is that the tree did not escape so in this particular case this is what it looked like so you have a tree which is a poisonous tree and the tree has not escaped into the plaintiff's property but the plaintiff's horse entered into this area so the horse entered into the defendant's property ate the leaves it was the same tree it was also a yew tree it ate the leaves and the horse died so everything else is the same but in this case the person who had this poisonous tree on his land he was not liable because here see again there has to be a dangerous thing was there a dangerous thing yes there was a poisonous tree it, it was dangerous was it kept on a non natural use of land yes because it was not naturally growing there it was not a natural use of the land but did it escape to the plaintiff no so all these three conditions have to be met if horse enters into your property and eats it it is the responsibility of the other person it's not your responsibility to stop his horse he should be careful about his horse so this is another case law so in this case nokes was not liable since nothing escaped his land and because the hurt was due to wrongful intrusion so there are two things one nothing has escaped plus the intrusion was also wrongful so it was an error from the plaintiff's part as well the plaintiff should have restricted his horse another case law is reed versus leons from 1947 in this case reed worked for leons explosive factory so there is an explosive factory where this guy is working for him there was an explosion injuring reed now in this case leons was not held liable it did not result in a tortious liability why because there was no negligence on his part he did not create an injury nothing had escaped from leon's compound to the compound of reed and manufacture and storage of explosives was not a non natural use of land why was this not a non natural use of land because look at the time period 1947 right next to the second world war so during a war period the manufacture and storage of explosives is a natural use of the land because your country is at war so in this case because there was no non natural use of land nothing had escaped and there was also no negligence so there was no tortious liability no strict liability so a strict liability comes into picture when these three things are met so how do you avoid being liable for uh, against this strict liability you can make use of exceptions such as consent of the plaintiff voluntary non fit injuria 
मीनिंग इफ समबडी इज वॉलेंटरली डूइंग समथिंग ही इज ही और शी इज विलिंगली डूइंग समथिंग देन दिस केस इज नॉट फिट फॉर एन इंजुरी टू अ विलिंग नो इंजुरी इज डन नाउ फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ यू हैव अ बाइक एंड दिस बाइक हैज ब्रेक्स दैट डू नॉट फंक्शन वेल एंड इफ आई कम टू यू एंड आई आस्क यू टू लेंड मी योर बाइक you tell me that the brakes of the bike are not functioning properly so it is dangerous so you have told me that it is dangerous to ride this bike but still if i am willing to take this bike if i am if i am voluntarily willingly if i am if i want to take this risk and then i suffer an accident because the brakes did not work so in that case i cannot sue you there will not be a tortious liability on you because i am a willing person here you have done all that you could have done there is no negligence on your part you told me beforehand and i voluntarily took up this risk if i try to sue you you can always make use of this exception voluntary non fit injuria anything done with the consent of the plaintiff will not result in a strict liability act of a stranger or a third party so for example if i have a reservoir and i have taken all the precautions there is no shaft that is leaking but if somebody else comes a third party comes and puts up an ex- an explosive and blasts the dam and that leads to a huge amount of flooding then in this case because it is due to an act of a stranger or a third party it is not because of in any negligence on my part so i can make use of this exception to avoid the strict liability similarly acts of god if there is a tree growing on my property and if this tree falls on your land then i will be held responsible because i should have taken all the precautions i am presumed to know that if i have an old tree then it can fall on your land but suppose there is a heavy thunderstorm lots of rains lots of uh, winds blowing at very high speeds and on that particular day if my tree falls on your land then i am not responsible because it is an act of god so this is an exception acts of god do not lead to a tortious strict liability acts where legislature excludes strict liability through a statute so the legislator uh, the legislature can bring out a statute and say that such and such thing will not result in a strict liability and default of the plaintiff that is if the plaintiff himself is doing something wrong remember this case the hurt was due to wrongful intrusion because the plaintiffs horse entered into nokes land wrongfully so if there is something that is a default of the plaintiff then the plaintiff cannot bring up a case of strict tortious liability another example is that if a person enters into a zoo and there is a tiger and this person is trying to feed the tiger or this person is trying to irritate the tiger disturb the tiger a person who is teasing a tiger in a zoo now because teasing a tiger itself is a wrong it is a default of the plaintiff now while teasing the tiger if the tiger attacks the person then the zoo authority will not be held liable because this wrong that is the injury to the plaintiff was caused because of his or her own actions which were wrong actions they were defaults so this is strict liability another liability is absolute liability absolute liability is an indian invention we do not have it in a large number of countries and absolute liability means strict liability minus the exceptions so in the case of absolute liabilities there are no exceptions how did we come to this concept of absolute liability it was right after the bhopal gas disaster 
so in the case of bhopal gas disaster the union carbide was storing huge amounts of mic gas methyl isocyanate that was used to uh, fabricate a uh, an insecticide now these gases huge stockpiles were being stored now the manual said that you should not be storing this gas because it's very much toxic so you should only create a small amount of this gas and use it as soon as possible there is no need to keep it so you should not stockpile it and for the small amount of gas that you are keeping with you it should be kept at a very low temperature so that it does not leak out all your pipes everything in the factory has to be checked again and again so that there are no leakages and then too if something happens there was the provision of a flare that would have burnt the gas and there was the provision of uh, chemical washes to uh, make this uh, chemical uh, non toxic so to wash away this chemical but what happened was that the union carbide flouted all the norms they kept huge reservoirs because it was cheaper they shut down the refrigeration to save on costs they did not do proper maintenance of the plant because they wanted to save money the flares were switched off because it takes gas to run it so why waste money on gas the chemical washers were also switched off plus the surrounding population was not given any warning they were not given any training no preparations now in this case when the gas leaked it led to huge amounts of death people are still suffering the consequences now if you talk about strict liability then union carbide said that no this gas leaked the methyl isocyanate leak because somebody came there and leaked it so they wanted to take care of this exception of something being done by a stranger or a third party and the supreme court said no if you are dealing with things that are so toxic then you cannot take any exception so the honorable supreme court of india in mc mehta and another versus union of india on 20th of december 1986 this is known as the oleum gas escape case so this is the case where the supreme court came up with the concept of absolute liability and this is what the supreme court had to say as new situations arise the law has to be evolved in order to meet the challenge of such new situations law cannot afford to remain static law is dynamic we have to evolve new principles and lay down new norms which would adequately deal with the new problems which arise in a highly industrialized economy we cannot allow our judicial thinking to be constricted by reference to the law as it prevails in england or for that matter of that in any other foreign country so we cannot restrict ourselves to the foreign laws we no longer need the crutches of a foreign legal order we are certainly prepared to receive light from whatever source it comes but we have to build up our own jurisprudence and we cannot countenance or allow an argument that merely because the new law does not recognize the rule of strict and absolute liability in cases of hazardous or dangerous liability or the rule as laid down in rylands versus fletcher as is developed in england recognizes certain limitations and responsibilities we have seen this before when we talk about the rule of law the judiciary plays a huge role the judiciary comes up with concepts that expands the rights of people and here is a very good example where the honorable supreme court is coming up with a very brand new concept that is not there anywhere in the world which is the this concept of absolute liability we in india cannot hold our hands back and i venture to evolve a new principle of liability which english courts have not done we have to develop our own law and if we find that it is necessary to construct a new principle of liability 
to deal with an unusual situation which has arisen and which is likely to arise in future on account of hazardous or inherently dangerous industries which are concomitant to an industrial economy there is no reason why we should hesitate to evolve such principle of liability merely because it has not been so done in england so this is how the supreme court is coming up with this concept we are of the view that an enterprise which is engaged in a hazardous or inherently dangerous industry which poses a potential threat to the health and safety of the persons working in the factory and residing in the surrounding areas owes an absolute and non delegable duty to the community so there is an absolute duty you cannot make use of exceptions it is non delegable you cannot say that i have delegated this responsibility to such and such contractors it is your duty because you are engaged in a hazardous or inherently dangerous industry so there is no exception at all to ensure that no harm results to anyone on account of hazardous or inherently dangerous nature of the activity which it has undertaken no exceptions whatsoever the enterprise must be held to be under an obligation to provide that the hazardous or inherently dangerous activity in which it is engaged must be conducted with the highest standards of safety and if any harm results on account of such activity the enterprise must be absolutely liable to compensate for such harm and it should be no answer to the enterprise to say that it had taken all reasonable care and that the harm occurred without any negligence on its part so just saying that you have taken all the reasonable care you have not been negligent is also not going to save you because you are absolutely liable if an enterprise is permitted to carry on a hazardous or inherently dangerous activity for its profit the law must presume that such permission is conditional on the enterprise absorbing the cost of any accident arising on account of such hazardous or inherently dangerous activity as an appropriate item of its overheads this principle is also sustainable on the ground that it that the enterprise alone has the resource to discover and guard against hazards or dangers and to provide warning against potential hazards so this absolute liability is also necessary because only this large enterprise has the resources to discover and guard against the hazards we would therefore hold that where an enterprise is engaged in a hazardous or inherently dangerous activity and harm results to anyone on account of an accident in the operation of such hazardous or inherently dangerous activity resulting for example in escape of toxic gas the enterprise is strictly and absolutely liable to compensate all those who are affected by the accident and such liability is not subject to any of the exceptions which operate vis-a-vis -vis the tortuous principle of strict liability under the rule in ryland versus fletcher we would also like to point out that the measure of compensation in the kind of cases referred to in the preceding paragraph must be correlated to the magnitude and capacity of the enterprise and the larger and more prosperous the enterprise the greater must be the amount of compensation payable by it for the harm caused on account of an accident in carrying on of the hazardous or inherently dangerous activity by the enterprise so what this honorable supreme court is saying here is that we are not going to just follow rylands versus fletcher we are going to invent or we have invented this concept of absolute liability that if you are doing something that is very hazardous then you are absolutely liable you cannot outsource it you cannot delegate the responsibility you cannot make use of any exceptions you cannot say that i was not negligent so i am not liable no just because you are doing a hazardous activity you are presumed to know everything and you have to take all precautions and if anything goes wrong you are liable so this is absolute liability another tortuous liability is vicarious liability liability for wrong committed by others 
the principle here is he who does an act through another does it himself such as a principal agent relationship so if you are using the services of somebody to do your job so you are the principal somebody else is the agent if the agent does something wrong you are liable if you are partners in doing something and your partner does something wrong you are also liable if you are the master and there is your servant and the servant does something wrong you are liable so these are vicarious liabilities you are liable for the conduct or wrongs done by others this liability may be joint joint liability means that each person in these situations is liable for the full amount it may be several where each person is liable for a proportionate amount so if there are 10 partners so each partner is responsible for 10% of the liability or compensation in the case of joint liability each partner is responsible for the full amount so you can sue any of the partners for the full amount and there can be joint and several meaning that you can sue any of the partners and it is the duty of that partner to ask the others to give the money so he has to collect the money but you can sue any of the partners for the full amount full amount to be paid but the defendant must pursue other obligers for their shares so this is the vicarious liability let us now look at the kinds of torts so these are the kinds of torts you can have torts affecting person assault is intentionally creating an apprehension in another person that a force would be used against him you are threatening somebody and if you actually do use this force intentional application of force to another without lawful justification it will become a battery so if you say or if you express that i am going to beat you then you are held liable for assault but if you actually beat somebody you are liable for battery then you have false imprisonment total restraint on the liberty of a person without lawful justification you have torts affecting reputation such as defamation publication of a statement which is false and defamatory which includes things like libel libel is a defamatory statement addressed to the i means something that is printed slander is something that is addressed to the ear and this requires a proof you have things like malicious prosecution somebody is doing a wrong prosecution the defendant is instituting prosecution with malice and without reasonable and probable cause against the plaintiff thereby affecting his liberty property and reputation and the prosecution has ended in the plaintiff's favor then there is this liability that gets created torts affecting immovable property somebody can trespass into a property unlawful entry somebody can dispossess the the rightful owner somebody can lead to an injury to easements meaning somebody can restrict things like light and air and right to wear right to water right to privacy and so on you can have torts affecting movable property trespass of goods that is you take the goods from somebody detention you keep those goods with you conversion you have changed these goods into your own name you can have torts affecting both person and property negligence which is breach of duty of care nuisance unlawful interference and fraud making a false statement knowing or recklessly with an intention that another person should rely and act to his detriment and the other does so act now as we have seen every wrongs have their own remedies and you can have different kinds of remedies you can have damages that is compensation in terms of money there can be a nominal damage a small damage in recognition of right substantial damage that is dam a compensation for the actual loss contemptuous damage which is a, which marks a disapproval of the conduct and exemplary which is punitive in nature it gives a punishment there can be a, a remedy of specific restitution of property 
that is the property should be given back to the original owner. You can have injunctions and we have looked at injunctions before and you can also have extra judicial remedies such as self-help. Somebody has taken your property, you go and take the property back. Abatement of nuisance. Somebody is creating nuisance, somebody has erected something to create a nuisance, you remove that nuisance. Or distress damage fees aren't, which is withholding the thing that caused the damage till the owner compensates the loss. For example, you have an agricultural field and a buffalo comes and eats away your produce. So you can hold this buffalo with you till the owner of the buffalo comes and pays you back. So these are extra judicial remedies. So in this lecture, we had a look at torts, which are tortuous liabilities, twisted liabilities. We looked at them in great detail. We looked at different kinds of liabilities, different kinds of torts and different kinds of remedies for them. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind. Thank you.